So, hi everyone. My name is Albert and I'm a Web3 developer. Uh, please don't throw any bottles at me just yet. You will find out why in uh, about a few slides, a few slides later. So, uh, I believe there are some people who hate Web3 or love Web3, uh, Web3. but uh, I'm just very curious uh, who's actually here. And uh, one hint, one note, uh, today I was actually going to speak about hacking. So, but the funny thing is that the person from Accenture who was supposed to give the speech before me about Web3, uh, he jumped off right after I committed. So I have to co kind of cover both Web3 to scratch the surface, as well as uh, focus a little bit on, on the hackathon specific. So, um, but I'm very curious who's here in the audience. Uh, are there any people who have participated in the hackathon? Quite a lot. Cool. Uh, how about Web Web three? Any people? Uh, anyone here who has developed distributed application? That? No hands at all. None. Okay. Cool. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, how about uh, just using crypto in your casual for your casual purposes? A few hands, quite cool, nice. Okay, uh, what about me? Uh, I'm a developer. Uh, I call myself a Web3 enthusiast because I quite recently, about a year ago or so, started going deeply with Web3. But uh, I am a .NET developer from uh, .NET 1.1, coding for food. And uh, why I want to speak about hackathons? Because I quite like hackathons. I participated in about. 20 of them, not as many as uh, this guy, he's uh, in the room right there. <laughs> not, not as many as he did, but still I have participated and I have won quite a few of them. And uh, yeah, as I told already, I'm very interested in Web3. But uh, professionally, I currently work with startups mostly. I like to think about it. Uh, I'm helping them to rise and thrill, and within specifically three aspects. Application, the proper application of blockchain, finding the real use case and uh, assembling the full stack uh, web application, full stack web three application for it. Also gamification with UX, and UX I think it's just an essential uh, uh, thing for every application, not only web three, but with web three it becomes even more important. And uh, I'm pretty keen into growth hack as well. So, a few fun facts about me. Uh, I do practice traditional ninja martial arts, so this is why I don't throw any bottles just yet if you don't like Web3. Um, and also, if you put the red card after this speech, just <laughs> make sure you write the reason why. Otherwise, I'm going to throw you. So, um, I have lived in the cave in Himalayas for a couple of weeks uh, while doing yoga, just fun facts here. And uh, I started skateboarding at 38, uh, so these are my entertainments. I also, more fun facts, I also studied information security uh, back then in Moscow with some of uh, people who later became the FSB officers. Uh, I was right off my... Actually, in the process of my studies, I was working for, I was building a security system for the Moscow State uh, uh, Municipality, which is uh, where they probably couldn't find any worse developer than me back then. But uh, this is why I know for sure why they currently suck in Ukraine. <laughs> because things just work that way. Uh, and uh, I also, at some point in my career, I was also developing and actually maintaining, implementing new features for Latvian uh, central biometry system. Uh, of course, there were many other things, but uh, we won't focus longer on them. Instead, why hackathons? So I like hackathons and startups. Uh, why hackathons? Because it's kind of your own commitment. You, uh, you cannot lose 
if you're making your own rules, right? So if, you're, if your specific goal for a hackathon is uh, achieving some uh, knowledge that you otherwise just couldn't make it uh, because you are stuck in your daily routine, for example, uh, and you empower yourself for burst creativity for this specific period of time, that is uh, a bit of, uh, it's, it's kind of a fresh air. And uh, it's very much a uh, stimulating factor. As well as you can easily validate your ideas, get fast feedback from them. Uh, of course, it's a skill. And why exactly Web3? Because Web3 has very much funded ecosystem. I mean, there are not so many topics currently that investors are looking at with, uh, like, precious breath. Uh, and those are machine learning, as I know, artificial intelligence, uh, some things related to metaverses, VR, uh, IoT, and uh, Web3, of course, so blockchain-related stuff. Uh, founded ecosystem means you can win some valuable prizes, uh, which doesn't happen if you, for example, participate in, in the military hackathon like this, which is like, not founded at all. Okay, uh, also the hackathon, I think it's uh, just an awesome way for us uh, geeks uh, to have fun. Um, I have to mention Web3, but I won't tell you the full story, how it emerged from being plain, read-only internet, uh, because you probably have heard a bit of it from every corner. Because currently, if you are in IT, currently people speak a lot about that, so that's, that's an old story, it's not so much interesting. But there's one key idea to understand from the current state of things. I would say that the most important topic currently with, uh, when people are talking about with it is decentralization. And those possibilities that decentralization give us as uh, developers and, and users of uh, decentralized applications. Of course, there have been a lot of critics in, the, in this area. For example, Moxie Marlinspike, who is a <coughs> developer of uh, Signal Messenger, uh, he explored the topic, he wrote quite a few Web3 applications, and uh, he concluded that the ecosystem is very cool, and uh, that's really nice to use, and there's a great idea, so it gives you a lot of interesting possibilities, but, but the, at the same time, the infrastructure is not very ready. It's not, that ye not, not yet there to really extensively use it everywhere. So it, it means you can find some use cases where this, this decentralization makes sense and it's applicable, but don't put it everywhere around it. At the same time, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who is the godfather of, uh, of the modern internet as we know it, uh, he kind of destroyed the Web3 speeches in the uh, last uh, Lisbon uh, Web Summit. So he says that it's too slow, too expensive, and too public. But at the same time, the guy has raised $30 million to create his own version of Web3 infrastructure, uh, how it's supposed to work. Uh, like, with the same decentralization ideas in mind, but not really focusing, I mean, not really uh, not, in, not in price of uh, speed, uh, cost, and uh, privacy. So why and how I recommend you to approach the web topic, uh, web three topic. Currently, there's not a big debate between. Uh, it's not. There's, you don't have to choose between the technological stack. It's currently based on and those values, those principles that decentralization actually gives us. So, uh, speaking. Uh, about the current state of things, we def definitely can conclude that users will more and more want to own their data, own their identity, but they're not, they don't want to maintain infrastructure on their own. So there might be some kind of 
hybrid scenarios where you make use of, uh, of uh, decentralization but not really put it everywhere. Of course, uh, all the economies get digitalized because digitalization of the economy gives us just endless automation possibilities, right? And uh, everything becomes a token. So token not only uh, values assets or uh, pooping, pooping puppies uh, pictures as NFTs. Uh, they're awesome. <laughs> but uh, even trust can be a token. Just think about that. So uh, tickets or anything else that has value can become a token in our modern, in our modern uh, state of technology with what uh, blockchain and this decentralization gives. So, of course, there are other things like wallets, having wallets in your browser, and, uh, and as well as uh, metaverses. So, when people speak about metaverses, they usually imagine some kind of virtual reality where things happen. But uh, not everybody thinks about the factor that uh, it should actually, to, to really become a metaverse, it, uh, not just a VR game, it should have some open and some somewhat decentralized uh, economy there inside. So you can trade those goods and you can exchange uh, those goods maybe with the other platforms. You can interact with some with this platform automatically offering your services. And uh, that's it. So Metaverse is much more than just VR. It also has uh, economy. So but decentralization, why do we need decentralization at all? Why there is such thing as blockchain? And uh, think about that as trust minimized agreements or unbreakable promises, promises you can break. Real example, this speech, if uh, I had kind of subscribed asynchronously to the to the promise of the person who was uh, supposed to speak about the Web3, then I could really execute my promise as well. So, chaining those promises, like real scenario in the offline world. But uh, in our days, uh, everything works based on agreements, like the, the chairs you're sitting on and the electricity that flows through the cables. And even this event to happen, there's a bunch of agreements between people. So, uh, blockchain gives us uh, that possibility to automate those agreements uh, where you don't fully trust everyone. Okay, um, so in order to do some applications, to create some applications with the blockchains, we probably will write smart contracts. Uh, smart contract is a program that lives in the blockchain and once you deploy it there, you cannot change it. So everybody is deploying their apps, it will stay there for, at the same address and uh, it's open for everyone to interact. Everybody can read the data from it, but, uh, only, but it only works by the rules yet that you write inside the smart contract. So, uh, important thing to remember is that when you're writing the data, when you're sending the data to the blockchain, uh, you pay gas for this transaction. It's a system mechanism that's uh, supposed to incentivize people to spin their Ethereum nodes to keep, to keep their services, uh, servers. So for the whole ecosystem to maintain itself, there is some kind of fuel that is necessary for these applications to run. But uh, when you're just reading something from it, when you're just getting data, for example, looking who, who owes this amount of money there on that smart contract, that's totally free, you can look there uh, freely. So the smart contract in Ethereum network is written in the language called Solidity. It's uh, somewhat similar to JavaScript, but it's not JavaScript at the same time. Uh, you can use it for many different purposes like uh, voting system, decentralized uh, or autonomous organizations, and uh, multi signature wallets, for example. Yeah, and uh, once the contract has been deployed, you cannot change it. No one can. That's the power of blockchain. 
or you can create uh, decentralized financial organizations. Uh, well, some of this, uh, yeah, decentralized exchanges when there is no uh, central individual who is uh, responsible for all these exchanges. So people just can find better deals just uh, across themselves. Decentralized autonomous organization. A uh, simple example of this is a multi-signature wallet. Like if you have two signatures out of three, you can get access to your to your data, to your assets. If, if not, then you don't. So on the bigger scale, this can be a number of people involved in some organization. If like most of them agree on so making some decision, then it works. Uh, so this is the way how they decentralize some voting decision making. It's applicable in a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, areas like supply chain, gaming, and you know, metaverses, of, of course. Social media now currently emerging. I'm, I'm very keen to see what, 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 becomes, uh, what becomes next thing with, uh, with the centralized social media. So identity management and of course NFTs, pictures of pooping puppies, uh, they're all there. So, and all that kind of stuff you can write with Solidity and, uh, and blockchain. So to code, ooh, so bad quality, not sure why it's that. But uh, to program Solidity, probably one of the first tools you will explore, explore is Vinix. Sorry for that, but it's supposed to be better. Um, uh, the remix is a web IDE that allows you basically to do all the stuff you ever need to do with, uh, with uh, interacting with the blockchain. So you can write a smart contract, you can deploy it to selected uh, Ethereum-based blockchain, you can interact with some existing code, uh, with some existing smart contract on the chain that is deployed already. You can, uh, if, if you have the source code, you can attach to any contract and call those methods just directly from this IDE. It's, uh, it's quite simple and very usable. So this is just if you're interested in uh, trying Solidity, this, this is the first place that you will come to. And I recommend you to, to try. But if you are developing something more, than just smart contract, you will of course need some library to connect you to your uh, smart contract and uh, running on the blockchain. So uh, currently there is a choice between of two libraries on the front end, because on the back end uh, there, is a, there are lots of libraries for every language, every platform, but specifically on the front end, uh, if you're writing JavaScript or TypeScript, uh, any subset of uh, JavaScript, so. Uh, it's Ethers.js or Web3.js. Uh, my tool of choice is Ethers.js. I think it's uh, nicer, <laughs> but uh, doesn't matter much. They both can do the thing. And uh, in order to spin your local blockchain just on your machine, because you want to do some testing, debugging, just uh, playing with it, there are also two tools: uh, Hard, Hard Hat and Truffle. Uh, Everybody has their own preference. So usually, Ethers, Jest, and Truffle people kind of use uh, hardhats or people kind of use them together. There's one more additional thing that you might need if you develop and deploy the real Web3 application. So uh, either you spin your local node of uh, Ethereum, so you run blockchain uh, locally, and for that you need a powerful servers and. Uh, in being all these security procedures, so it can be a lot of hassle. So then you can call it directly and it will be automatically aligned and synchronized with the rest of the blockchain. Or you use some node provider. And these are third party services that uh, allows, that gives you uh, possibility to connect and call the blockchain, uh, uh, to the blockchain stuff, not just with a few calls, but like really in industrial scale. That's only needed when you run it in industrial scale. Well, there's a lot of requests. And uh, don't look on, only at the pricing because there are some cool options that uh, I probably would go for Alchemy if, if you're just beginning because it has 
you know, some really cool features you, know, you want to pull this stuff with. So, uh, what else? What, what else you might need? Um, you, of course, you can write everything from scratch, but there are some very prepared and security proofed uh, set of uh, set of contracts, implementations of of uh, different standards for different kind of tokens, implementation for different tools that you might want to use. Uh, and this is called Open, Open Zeppelin. It's kind of a golden standard for writing secure, secure blockchain applications. Uh, and it has even more power, power rather than just implementing some uh, plain tokens. For example, it can give you such thing as upgradable smart contracts. Remember I said that the smart contract is not really upgradable. When you write it, it stays there forever. Right? So this thing actually gives you kind of prepared, uh, pre-written mechanism how you can, with two contracts, you actually deploy in two contracts, uh, one part of it is not upgradable, is, uh, uh, and, and the second is upgradable. So you just deploy, of course you cannot change the second smart contract, it stays there forever, but you just deploy another one with the second part and switch the first one to work with that, with the new one. But this is the way how you can actually upgrade the smart contracts. But this also contains some tricks in it, because uh, if you are, for example, writing some uh, ERC20, which is a common token used for, for ICOs and fundraising, and uh, you, of course, have to provide uh, the source code, you have to valid, verify that source code. Source verification is very important because everybody else who's interacting with your smart contract or otherwise giving you money, they want to be sure about what are they interacting with. This is why blockchain has this possibility. They can see the, read the source of, of the smart contract and they can be entirely sure that uh, it's, it's the same smart contract that is running. It's not changed. So, uh, usually investors, let's say, they want to be sure that you're not cheating them. Because if you change something, redeploy something, it, you might cheat on them. You can steal their money and run away. And uh, this is why upgradable smart, smart contracts actually considered, considered somewhat a gray or a dark practice to, if you're actually doing fundraising. But you might not do really fundraising. There are some other purposes where upgradable contracts might make sense. Uh, also, keep in mind that for fundraising, it's very important to go through some security audits because, as I said, people don't want to be investing in something that they don't fully understand how it works and behind. Uh, but the ecosystem is really, really much bigger than that. I mean, there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of projects that's built on top of 4 web 3 and on top of the blockchain. But uh, just to give a few examples, there is such, such thing as IPFS, uh, which is interplanetary file system, which allows you to keep your data, put it somewhere, and it gets distributed by, by everywhere. So uh, you're not storing it in one single place. And that way you can write the file in IPFS, let's say it's a bin puppy picture, and you keep the hash of this file in your blockchain and that's it, you'll get your NFT which cannot be changed. Uh, other tools might be that might be interesting and uh, might be useful if you want to go and uh, play in a hackathon with it is uh, things like money streaming, for example Superfluid which gives you possibility like try receive payments by seconds, like flow of the money. And just imagine how many practical, I'm not, I'm, sure it's, I'm not sure if it's many practical applications that you can think of, but there are definitely very interesting scenarios where you can apply. Uh, also, the blockchain is, uh, is something that is kind of self-contained, so it does not take in information from, from outside. 
but in order to connect it from and to receive some data from, from the other sources, you might want to use oracles. Oracles are authorities that, uh, that you can call from your smart contract and uh, you get your data secured from your different APIs securely and uh, in a decentralized manner. But of course, a lot of uh, example of that one is uh, Chainlink. So, yeah, uh, streamer for data streaming and many, many more. There are things for databases in the blockchain, which is not always needed, but sometimes there are scenarios for it. Tools for gaming, NFTs, DeFi, DAOs, and uh, a lot of other stuff. So how do we kick start? Uh, first you want to select your chain, uh, the blockchain itself. It might be EVM, which stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine, uh, which, which is a bunch of different blockchains. You just have to select one. Uh, you probably have heard of Ethereum, which is a kind of layer one chain. Uh, but there are some ch different blockchains which are much, much more cheaper to run your code at. For example, if uh, I want to deploy my smart contract to Ethereum, that might cost me like a hundred or a couple of hundred dollars, uh, which is very expensive if I'm, if I'm running my tests, right? But uh, if I do it on Polygon, even on the main network, not the test, but the main network, it just costs a few cents or even fractions of sense. So these layer two solutions, are, they do a lot of additional tooling on the top of, uh, of the base of, of Ethereum. So that allows, allows much better scaling and of course much more transactions can go through these blockchains and uh, they are faster and they are cheaper. Uh, there are also a bunch of uh, non-Ethereum non blockchains, uh, things like Solana, Algorand, uh, recently Ton has appeared, uh, Polkadot, Cardano, different kinds of projects. The difference between them uh, is that they're working on the same principles, but they're different blockchains. So there might not be solidity. Some of them, uh, with some of them you have to write Rust. Uh, or the, the kind of they have their own ecosystem but these are all player one chains and uh, here this list is a layer two, layer two that is based built upon on the ethereum uh, the usual architecture looks like for, for very simple distributed uh, application scenario, you only have front end and smart contract. And that is kind of enough for, for the beginning. You have the front end who, who's interacting with your smart contract. But let's say that's some kind of a game. You're writing a game, that's, uh, the rules are written in the blockchain, so it's, sometimes it's querying the blockchain for to see who's, uh, who's winning, for example, uh, to give back his uh, profits and wings. But uh, sometimes, that, that's in a simple scenario, but usually you also want to add there some kind of a backend. And uh, it's up to you what exactly you want to use in the backend. But on the front end, my personal experience with .NET and uh, WebAssembly, I tried to use uh, Blazor WebAssembly with, uh, with the Polygon network. And uh, my experience was quite heavy because uh, the ecosystem is really friendly with JavaScript. I mean, all of the tools that, if, if you are at Hackathon and there are some, some sponsors that are providing you know, wallets, for example, you want to integrate as many of those tools into your application just because to, to get the prices from them, for example. And uh, the JavaScript ecosystem is currently much more friendly for blockchain tools rather than of course, there are things like Ethereum, uh, which is a libraries, a set of libraries for .NET to, to work with the blockchain. And there are different projects for different languages that kind of uh, allows you to do the same. But uh, I understood for, for, for myself, <laughs> I switched to React instead of writing Blazor. Um, 
So my stack of preference is uh, Polygon as, as a blockchain because it's cheap, it's quick. Uh, Solidity, of course, it's the language for Ethereum networks. Uh, Next.js or React, uh, which is like almost the same, just making Next.js gives you some additional abilities, mm -hmm. which are quite cool. Uh, Hardhat and Ethereum.js to access all the blockchain and deploy it. And, uh, deploy the site itself to Azure static sites, but uh, it doesn't matter where you deploy, of course, it's uh, your, uh, cloud, it only depends on your preferences. But my recommendation, like the biggest recommendation in terms of Web3, connect those things in advance. Because when you're coming at the hackathon and you're trying to plug these things together, you think, okay, I'm going to be using this, and I like this, with, to try this one, uh, you're gonna have a lot of hassle, and you'll have to focus on fixing the issues instead of actually hacking your your application, instead of actually making some results of your hackathon project. So connect those things in advance. And if you don't, there's a wonderful bootstrapper that you can use, which is called Scaffold, uh, which is made by Austin Griffin. Uh, one of uh, Ethereum, Ethereum activists. Uh, I don't quite like it. Uh, I appreciate more when I when I fully understand how the, how this library, how this bootstrapper is built. So I created it on my own. But uh, if you don't have time for it, if you don't have to play with it in advance, so it's careful. Thief is like the first first tool you want to be using. It covers all the needs uh, in order to write the web application. It's based on uh, Next.js, as, as I recall. But I had some weird problems with uh, TypeScript version of it. I believe that branch is not really, was not very usable. So play with it on your own risk. presentation is running from the intranet. I think I will have to restart it. This happens when you onboard some weird new tooling. This is a bright future. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, looks like I'm almost in time. So, uh, the hackathon aspect of it. I already said we come prepared. Try to assemble those things in advance, not not at the hackathon itself. I mean, I know usually people are deep inside your daily routine and uh, you don't know, have time for it, but. Uh, it will just uh, burn your time in, in, in the process, in the middle of hackathon. So having your bootstrap ready, it's like, uh, it's, it's massively improves your chain, your, massively improves your chances to, to win something. Uh, what I would like to recommend also to do in advance before the hackathon, is uh, trying to solve, if you're playing with, uh, with Solidity and doing some smart contracts, trying to uh, marry it together with your web frontend, or even, even more, try to play with the signing on the back end and, uh, or on the front end and signature validation verification on the, on the chain. Of course, obviously, you don't sign 
cryptographically signed things on the chain itself. But you can do signatures on, in your own system. And on the blockchain, you can check that signature. Let's imagine a situation. You're, winning, uh, you're playing a game uh, against someone. And, and you're the winner. You're supposed to take your profit. But how does uh, the blockchain, where the profit lives, actually knows about, uh, if you are the winner or not? It's, it's not that easy because the blockchain is self-contained. It doesn't, doesn't access the information outside unless you use some oracle. So the typical scenario, you don't really, after the winning your game, let's say there is some back-end logic on your API and the winner is you. So in yeah, usual Web2 scenarios, you think of it, okay, there's a transaction happening after you won, some money gets sent to, to the winner. But with the blockchain, what's important to understand, you think about the, those flows the other way around. User is always in the center. So user is paying gas, a little bit of gas for making this call, making a transaction, or writing any information in the chain. For example, I want to take this profit. But I want to take this profit, what it means on the blockchain? It means sending your uh, request and there has to be some data written in the other array, in the other mapping. Uh, you people take some data from one place and put it in another. So you're making a transaction that costs gas. You're paying a little bit, but you still pay for this transaction. The user pays who actually calls the flow. So, which might cause some weird occasions if you try to do this on the back. Instead of, you, instead of user, you as the winner are calling the blockchain to, to receive my prize and provide some uh, signed cryptographical proof that I have, I have uh, rights to for, I have my claims for this prize. Verified because the server has verified me, signed my request. Uh, if you do this instead on the back end side, when you're winning, the transaction automatically gets sent to you. So you might just meet some issues with, uh, with those calls because you cannot be entirely sure that the call actually succeeded. You cannot be sure about how much gas you are putting uh, in order to, for this transaction to succeed. So there are some weird tricks, and you will be more prepared if you're going to, to the hackathon, if you solve this problem beforehand. Because uh, usually people uh, write more complex applications that will involve not only web application, not only front-end and uh, smart contracts, but there will definitely be some APIs, some logic. So you just want to be uh, sure about you can write this more complicated scenario and uh, sign these trust agreements. Another thing to play with, uh, if you have time for it, is IPFS because uh, some files in a decentralized file system might be a useful case. And uh, one of those useful cases is, for example, playing with Merkle trees. Uh, Merkle trees is just a tree of hashes. Uh, you cannot change anything there. For example, why it's needed, uh, for example, if you are working with Ethereum blockchain. And uh, it's, it's quite costly when you're writing. For example, you need to, you are a creator of uh, NFT collection for 10,000 images, and you have a whitelist for 10,000 people. So 10,000 of addresses, 64 bytes uh, each. Uh, there's a list, and uh, when Ethereum gas is on a high price, it can cost uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to write this simple list, which is almost nothing, but to write it in Ethereum network. So if you're using expensive stuff like Ethereum itself, uh, it might be useful to think about that problem a little bit different. Instead of adding a loud list, allowance list there, so every person who is in that list will be able to, to generate an FT for playing, right? so has access. Instead of storing his uh, address, you want to store some one value, hash. The hash of uh, some place where, the, where this 
hash tree, the full hash tree lives in IPFS. And with this hash tree, you can validate uh, you can validate if, that's a, if that address is actually in the list. So with writing in blockchain itself, a very little, small part, small part of, of the data, not the full list, you get the cheap way of doing this, uh, storing this, and uh, do, do these allowance checks. Uh, those are scenarios that uh, I would recommend to play in order to get some skill for, for a hackathon, like the real preparation. But of course, if you want to dive into solidity and uh, learn to use those tools, there's a bunch of resources. Uh, there's a lot of information where you can learn very, very basics of uh, Web3 and uh, blockchain development. Um, so talking about the hackathon. Uh, every hackathon usually has his purpose. For example, this event uh, is happening because uh, Edgar is making money out of uh, advertising and uh, some people get hired. And this is how things work. So, also hackathons, they have they have a purpose. If you understand who are the sponsors who are actually funding this, sponsoring this event, you know what exactly do they want. Are they interested in some cool presentations? Maybe there are investors who are interested in marketing presentations. At most of the hackathons, uh, probably that, uh, that you and I have seen, people really do that. They build cool presentations, but the stuff doesn't work. And the coolest presentation get the prize. So this is not the case when, when there are really technical uh, sponsors that are interested in you. Uh, bringing more people in you as a developer to create some applications to bring in more people into their platform. Uh, well, I'll give you an example, example later on. So, usually a bunch of sponsors and you can get some prizes from more of them. So, so take a look what exactly you can apply to your project, what your idea uh, come by what you can combine it with, uh, like with the least cost and uh, the best, the best uh, results. Of it. Also, validate your ideas early, but not too early, because you still have to come come up with, with some vision. But Hackathon is a great place where you can uh, just talk to people and see what's the response. At best, you get your first customers before you even start writing your application. This is the idea that has to be in mind. If they're really going to be using your application. So if you can persuade anyone, you can start coding. Uh, and of course, uh, UX is always the king, the king user experience, but uh, we've, uh, because uh, the Web3 ecosystem is it's kind of specific. You have to use some wallet. And you have to use some wallet browser, for example, MetaMask browser, if you're accessing Web3. Uh, application from your phone, which is not always obvious for, for people when they only start using it. So it, it needs even more attention spent on UX with Web3. Uh, team and visibility, just I would say find your unique feature because all projects are cool, many projects are cool. Uh, but, uh, the jury judges, when they will be judging your projects, it's cool when they have some associations with you and your specific project. For example, a very easy way to do that in even some online hackathon is using some unicode symbols. Just define your project, trying to uh, make an association with some unicode symbol and just Apply it in every message you send. And just do that all the time. And try to excel even more. I don't know when you're filming the video or or, or just presenting even on offline pitch. Try to use that symbolic. So regarding the pitch, I would say uh, like in poker, you can you cannot win every hand, but if you're good enough, you get profit on the distance. So consider hackathons as not being one-time event, but being a discipline when a hack -a club. Being a discipline when you go there again and again, you have some some of your own personal goals for it, 
And uh, at the distance, you can uh, start winning because you understand how the whole thing works. And be memorable, of course, um, at, at the pitch time. Uh, afterwards, they will be deciding who gets the prizes, and they need to memorize you somehow. So those are my recommendations regarding the regarding the hackathons itself. But my example was a crypto wordle. Uh, has anyone played wordle here? Could you? Quite a few hands. Cool. So uh, about a year ago, it uh, it got viral, and I wanted to exploit this virality, virality. Uh, so I imagined of the fun project, which is the same world of game, but connected to the blockchain. So, like, the economical stuff happens within the blockchain. And I also wanted to play with uh, putting some, putting the stack together to uh, use the Blazor WebAssembly together with this Ethereum library and the Polygon chain. So, uh, and, uh, my real goal was really putting all of these things together and uh, creating a bootstrap bundle. But then I saw that actually that that particular hackathon has uh, like three hundred thousand dollars in the prizes. I mean, why not to apply for winning something real? Really? And uh, so I spent probably a week. On that stuff. Hi, I'm Marcel from Crypto World. Th this is. We appreciate the possibilities that cryptocurrencies give to society. This is our first crypto-related project attempt to jump into Web3 space. This, uh, we believe that using cryptocurrencies for simple casual purposes is the key for technological development of the whole ecosystem. We are very focused on usability and looking for ways to improve user crypto experience. So, what are we doing? The game of world powered by Blocktree. Unlike the original world, there is a six-letter English word. You deposit some crypto tokens and try to guess it. You have limited amount of attempts. If you guess the letter correctly, the square becomes green. If the letter is correct but in the wrong position, it becomes yellow. After you play the game, you can create your own word and just share it with people. If they lose, you get their coins. But if they win, only the first winner can get your coins. A little about the team. We are a team of two people and I'm responsible for playing Fortnite. I'm a senior Fortnite expert. My partner is a hacker with 20 years experience in IT. He used to be a development manager but has quit because he couldn't live without hacking. We are very new to crypto and this is the very first attempt. Please don't judge too harsh. How did we make it? The technologies we used are .NET and Blazor WebAssembly. We deployed smart contracts with Polygon Network and the app is working so you can try it live as well as see the code repo. We have tons of future plans leaderboard, allow users to vote for the next feature, intro about how to easily get coins, to make it more distributed, integrate Binance Network, consider Solana and Polkadot blockchains, integrate other wallets and growth hacking. So, what do we need from you? If you're an inv investor looking for a great project to invest two million dollars, you can make cryptocurrencies cool again. But even if you're not, just try to play 
and uh, share it to let more people participate. Thank you and have great fun! So this is a good example of how the project itself matched the, what the sponsors really wanted because they wanted to be invested 200k for specifically Polygon to push their ecosystem, to push other projects you know, making something cool in their ecosystem. This was exactly what they wanted so I got one of those uh, 15, it was not the first prize, it was 15 prizes uh, of 6,000 okay, uh, 6, uh, USDC, so it's quite cool for, for almost a week. And this is pretty much it. I, am, I created this uh, Discord uh, server, so if anyone wants to discuss with three related topics or even participate in the hackathons together, discuss some tooling and uh, tips and tricks for hackathons, feel, feel welcome. Uh, otherwise, we're done. Thank you for your attention and uh, if you want to ask something, please do. Yep. Let me please provide some use cases for Web3. I mean serious use cases. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to focus currently in this speech on use cases. I'm, I'm very uh, keen to discover some real use cases where it really makes sense. So, I currently see that there is a lot of problems that people are trying to uh, to solve with, uh, with, for example, logistics. Yeah, but uh, it, it doesn't always necessarily needs that that level of decentralization. Uh, but sometimes it does. So you really have to be in, in, in inside the business. But okay, one case is with. Uh, with uh, carbon tokens, where you cannot really cheat on uh, how much uh, carbon waste do you produce, how much carbon do you uh, do you burn. So, of course, it sounds very painful if, if the infrastructure works on a proof of work, not proof of stake, but it usually does with proof of stake, and it's quite valid in, uh, in that case. Yeah. question a little bit, sorry for that. Uh, um, if you have to, maybe, maybe, maybe more concrete, if you have to name, as a crypto, uh, as a web enthusiast, if you have to name uh, one brightest success story, uh, a service or a company that, that is, should be, if everyone will agree that it's, it's a success story in terms of uh, growing annual revenue and the amount of users and in terms of solving the problem better than that will permit you. So the brightest success story from the battery world, which one should be named if there is one? The brightest which is outshines everything that I have yes. seen so yes. far is the Vitalik uh, Buterin itself with with set of tools that he has created. Not holding any particular uh, particular use case in mind, but actually providing the ecosystem to play with those tools and to discover those scenarios. So I believe we are finding, uh, we are in a stage of finding those uh, best use cases, but uh, I know that uh, some people have really benefited from using uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, but at the same time they have different problems to, to struggle with. Uh, some crypto investment stuff like Aave, for example, and their provided platforms and protocols. So those are probably the highest. Uh, but they're still within crypto. So I, I'm, I could say that the, the brightest success stories are contained in the crypto ecosystem. So if you are a crypto hater at all, don't, don't go there. But, uh, I believe that there are certain scenarios within logistics, for example, supply chain, where it's actually applicable. So traceability or something. Well, because uh, we live in a world where uh, agreements matter, because everything works up on, upon, on the agreement. But at the same time, uh, parties don't always trust each other. So 
it's the way of uh, kind of be creative about it. <laughs> but uh, first, you have to be open in order to be creative. I mean, creating this game, of course, there's no sense in making Wordle run in the distributed blockchain. But when you just try to find how it might work there, and you discover something that actually you can uh, write the whole game rules, not inside your API, but uh, with uh, zero knowledge proofs written in the smart contract itself. Mm, I consider that as tooling to play with, and it provides the mindset for using those, uh, those trends, for exploiting the trends that I was talking about previously. I hope I can I, I, I can share uh, uh, my, so my ask the question is that uh, me as a, as a person that was not the question about three, what, what, what seems uh, the biggest problem is this need in order to interact with the system, uh, you need uh, in the browser you need this um, extensions, as well, you saw it to, to, to use the wallet and then as you yes. mentioned you need the metamask or whatever the name was on your phone, so and this is um, like the browser that everyone has and uses for many, many years, uh, it is, to me, it seems like a non, at least at the beginning of 2023, is the obstacle that I don't see how to overcome unless, you know, uh, the people will become web free geeks. So, is there a solution? Uh, or maybe, yeah, do you see it as a, as a blocking issue as well? This is why I mentioned the usability is in the, in the center of everything because it really shifts uh, the user meets different challenges whether he's just using a simple web to application so and, uh, getting your getting his wallet and getting some crypto on that wallet and actually learning how to use it is still some uh, some gap that he has to overcome so it's it's uh, tricky and uh, might be difficult to help him overcome those issues but uh, there is a diff, uh, stable trend on uh, because uh, browsers at some point will, most of them will, I guess, onboard uh, some crypto wallets. Currently, you have uh, Opera that, uh, that has done that already. And I think more and more of these tools will be emerging as more and more uh, casual uh, crypto users appear. This is why specialists don't dealt with the word casual because uh, if it's not only the tool for investors, then it makes sense uh, for, for the wider audience. Okay. So I think these tools are going to be emerging. We are quite in an early stage and uh, I don't think that in 10 years from now the Web3 is going to be looking the same way as it does now. It's probably more, it's, it pro be probably more likely based on the stack and uh, infrastructure provided by uh, Tim Berners-Lee and <laughs> projects like that. Yeah. But still some ideas are going to be involved. And uh, that mind shift that, uh, that is necessary in order to build decentralized application, I think we have quite a good chance to play with it already. Yeah? Uh, I hope you usually First of all, thank you for your speech and presentation. It was quite interesting. Uh, regarding the hackathons themselves, uh, how do you usually find ones, find the appropriate ones, whether there's some calendar on them or something like that? Um, since you start with one, it just goes one after another, and uh, you somehow subscribe to one, and you find it in the email or Facebook, I don't know some relevant ads. There are some communities where you, you can actually just subscribe to the email list and there's a lot of hackathons happen every single second. Uh, for example, MLH, I believe, uh, Major Hacking Week, uh, the guys who stands behind Junction, a big hackathon in Finland. Uh, it's about 1, 000, more than 1,000 participants. Uh, Quite, quite massive event with a lot of geeks in there. Uh, so we just get into those email lists. You have people who participate in different hackathons. For example, the last hackathon I participated in was because I found out from Ronalds. Uh, that's, that's the way it happened. 
Yeah. But uh, coming to this uh, Discord server, and I can share. It. I've been posting memes about hackathons I participated. I already participated in. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Chocolate time.